just want to say good morning and welcome to Phoenix Seventh-day Baptist Church. Nice to see faces we haven't haven't seen in a while and faces we haven't seen in a little less time. But nice to see all of you here today. So grateful to be back home after a, an a interesting trip that we had and uh, some things that we weren't expecting, you know, but uh, but good folks. The last two Sabbaths, we were in two different Seventh-day Baptist churches and uh, one in Arkansas, one in Texas, and had just, just a real great time fellowshipping with those folks, but really glad to be back home. Let me just remind those of our regular folks here that we have a, a business meeting tomorrow afternoon. Uh, the email has been sent out, and so we'll we'll see you all again at two o'clock tomorrow. Again, welcome. Let's let's pray. Father God, it is so good to be with your people on your Sabbath. Thank you, Father, for uh, bringing this congregation together. And uh, Lord, for this time now, we just want to glorify you, want to worship you. As we sing, let us sing it for your glory. As we look into your word, may we hear you speaking to us. Bless us. Help us to worship you in all that we do today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, our first song, the lyrics are in the bulletin, will be The Goodness of God. Uh, so the scripture reading will be Psalms 32, and I'll be reading from the New International Version today. And it's a little long. It's 11, which is the whole chapter. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sins the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave, me, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be founded. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Bless you. I will instruct you and teach you in the ways you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. How about I say that again? Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous, seeing all you who are upright in heart. Uh, for prayer today, I wanted to ask if anybody had any um, requests they'd like to bring forward. Uh, before we go into the next song. Uh, Leland, I know um, Emily is on your heart deeply right now, as uh, she is with us. Um, did you have any other requests you'd like to raise? Um, go ahead, Priscilla. Your mom, absolutely. It's for her mobility, right? Get better. Yeah. James? Uh, cancer and I have cancer. Uh, Got you. Thank you. Who else? Lynn? 
Go ahead. Yeah. Guy named Tom. Tom. You prayed. Anything specific or just? We raised Tom. Gotcha. All right. Thank you for sharing what's on your heart. If you have silent requests too, um, we used to do this at my old church. Feel free to raise your hand um, and we'll ask God to be with you. If you'll bow your heads in prayer, please. Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful day we have in Phoenix before the heat uh, comes and grips us. Uh, thank you for all the flowers that are blooming, and please heal us from our allergies, which are great. Um, I'm so thankful to see visitors here um, from Denver and Phoenix, and I really hope that um, you will take care of them in their travels. We do have a number of people we'd like to raise up to you. Priscilla's mom, uh, in general, we just want her to get better. We want um, to ask for prayer for her legs and uh, for her life. Uh, we have friends out there with cancer and autoimmune um, diseases. Please uh, help them to either receive the relief that they're they're seeking or um, you know find find ways to cure them. Uh, we uh, raise up Scott and um, just bring him to you as well as Tom, um, and that his heart may be uh, spoken to by your spirit. Uh, Scott's cancer specifically, I want to make sure I spoke to that. And um, uh, also, I want to be with my dad, who um, just finished his uh, treatments of radiation. Uh, there's cancer everywhere, Father, and um, it's troubling, so please be with us and our families and our hearts. And um, finally, I, I really want to raise up Emily uh, Leland's uh, goddaughter, niece, um, She's a fantastic person who you've used as an instrument in in our lives, and um, we hope, Father, and ask for you to please have your um, will be done, um, whether that's to aid her in her discomfort uh, from the cancer or um, completely eradicate it. We know that you know best for us, and we ask that you please um, send your spirit extra hard down that way, um, not just for her, but for the hearts of those who are around her who are suffering as well. Please be with um, name has been dropped. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> our speaker today. I'm so sorry, because I know you're sitting right there. And for some reason, the name is just gone. It is come back. Is Steve. Steve. Oh, I'm so sorry. Please be with Steve as, um, as he gives our message today. And thank you for bringing um, our family back safely from their trip. Uh, thank you for all that you do, Father. And I pray in your son's name. Amen. And um, if you don't mind standing for the next hymn, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Steve. The song will be there as a redeemer. Um, they'll be on the second page of your bulletin. How many people here like gospel music? Oh, of course, I suppose it all depends on how you define gospel music. And you might be wondering what I mean by that term. What are gospel songs? Are they uh, hymns in the hymn book? Some of them certainly are. Uh, at least they should be. <laughs> Many people think of gospel music as a as a men's quartet singing in four part harmony with a nice little band, you know, backing them up. How about the songs that we sing here each Sabbath, along with the recordings? Some of them are gospel songs if they have gospel content. Lots of different styles of singing have been called gospel music over the years. And now I've always thought that the words are always more important than the music. Um, anyway, um, let's see, how about the two songs that we sang today? Are they gospel music? Uh, take a look at the words again. Get out that, you know, really 
now that we're not thinking about the singing, just look at the words. Uh, what gospel content do you see there? Anyone? Anyone? Just just pick out some phrases that you would say is the gospel. Anyone? Pardon? Oh, goodness of God, for sure. God is good. I think that one also said God is faithful. Um, what do you see in that second song? Thanks. Ah, yes. Very good. And, um, yep. Let's see. I see Redeemer. There's a good Bible word for you. Lamb of God. Goodness, that's gospel through and through. Slain for sinners. Not bad. Anything else? Um, oh, I, I see. Sorry? Yeah, all right. Let's see. In, in that second chorus, I see forgiving us. Oh, wait a minute. I guess it's for giving us. Okay. I guess I was wrong. Um, well, today I have another gospel song for you, and it's Psalm 32. So maybe it would be better to call it a gospel psalm. Is that okay? Now, I could have asked Jessica to sing it, but... Um, I guess she didn't know the tune. I don't know. David knew the tune. Um, anyway, when I read this psalm not long ago, it struck me how much gospel content this psalm has. Now, it doesn't mention Jesus by name, but it, but it has some good stuff about the gospel we believe. Now, I may have told this to some of you before, but I don't remember that uh, you know back years ago and just a few years ago now <laughs> when i still had my technical writing job i used to talk with a muslim guy there in my office um Kasim was just as nice a guy as you would ever want to meet and um and he was always you know he was always a good worker very helpful whenever whenever I asked him questions about the software, which, of course, I did once in a while because I had to write uh, documentation for that software. So I needed to go to those software guys and ask them all sorts of information. He was one of the best. But sometimes he and I happened to happen <laughs> to meet in the break room, and occasionally we had lunch together. And we usually talked about something more important than the software. I try, you know, I tried to tell him that the Christian faith is true. He tried to tell me that Islam is true. Um, I have to say that after all of our talking, neither one of us changed our mind. But it was good stuff to be able to talk with him. The weird thing is that he said he he said he really didn't want to convert me over to Islam. He said that Muslims have great respect for the other two monotheistic religions that came earlier. You know what monotheistic means, right? Everybody? Okay. One God is literally what it means. The word, um, you know, I don't know if, if all Muslims agree with about this, but uh, Kasim said that if you're in the Jewish or the Christian religion, you shouldn't change. You shouldn't convert to Islam. I've always thought that was quite an interesting thing for him to say. Um, uh, 
And that's just actually one of the things he said, which I had a little trouble understanding. <laughs> Seemed to me that if your faith is true, it's true, and the others are false. Um, so we continued talking from time to time, and, and I continued praying for him. I don't know if he prayed for me. One of the issues he and I talked about was sin. I asked him, what is the Muslim solution to the problem of sin? His answer surprised me. And again, I don't know if all Muslims would say the same thing, but, but he, he said that Muslims don't really think much in terms of sin. Um, now, you know, later I did an, an online search in the Quran for the words like sin and forgive. They're in there, but it kind of sounded to me like Muslims don't really make much of it. Hmm. And I wonder, how can you not make something of sin? In the New Testament and the Old, it's, it's the major problem. Everybody but Jesus got into trouble with God because of sin. It didn't start with David and Bathsheba, though I guess that's probably the most famous case after Adam and Eve, of course. Well, David, the man who committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed, he's the guy who wrote this psalm. Number 32. Now, his, his best sin psalm is probably number 51. You should look at that sometime. But 32 not only has sin, it has forgiveness. It must have been written at you know, some other time when he wasn't right in the middle of a, of a big sin problem. <laughs> like he was with, with uh, number 51. In the first couple of verses here in, in 32, he was looking back to sins already forgiven, not begging for forgiveness like he did in Psalm 51. Blessed is he, verse 1. This is one of the greatest blessings of putting your trust in Christ, knowing that your sins are forgiven and God accepts you. The Bible teaches that Jesus took our sins on himself and died to pay the penalty. Because the price has been paid, God can forgive us. So the Old Testament looks forward to what Jesus would do. The New Testament explains what he did and how he did it. And ever since then, we look back to the cross with thanks to God for what Jesus did. That is forgiveness that we don't deserve. But we have it anyway because of God's grace. Another neat thing here is that David showed some real insight into what it means to be forgiven. Verse 2 says, to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. That's what it says in my version, or we heard earlier, whose sins the Lord does not count against him, which is really more clear. You know, sometimes, I don't know, you might find this shocking, but sometimes Christians choose to judge other Christians. We're not supposed to do that, right? Uh, now, we should discern right from wrong, good from evil, truth from error, but we don't have the right to condemn somebody for his behavior or his false belief. Only God can do that. 
the other side of that coin then is only God can forgive sins. I mean, in the eternal sense. We do need to forgive each other so that, I mean, just for one reason, so that we can get along with each other and and have fellowship with each other. But forgiveness or eternity, taking away our sins forever, that's God's business. When he forgives sins, it's a promise that in the day of judgment, he will not hold our sins against us. And really, it works the same way when we forgive each other, which we need to do, by the way, uh, which we're commanded to do. If I do a terrible thing to you and you forgive me, it means that, at least it's supposed to mean that <laughs> you won't you won't bring it up again. You won't hold it against me. And not only that, forgiving me is going to help you too by removing any bitterness, hopefully before it even gets started. The Bible says, forgive one another, just like it says that God forgives us. David had a handle on that here in this psalm. Hundreds of years before Jesus went to the cross, David saw God not counting our sins against us. David looked forward to it. And then after the cross, Paul was looking back as, for example, he wrote to the Corinthians, God was reconciling the world to, to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Same thing. So it's like we've already been judged and we're found with no sins being counted against us. That's good news. Now, so far, it's all been about God and what he did, does in forgiving us. Do we have any part in this? Um, is there something we're supposed to do? The next few verses answer that. And the main thing I see there is to confess. In verse 5, David realized what he, what he had to do. So he said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. Now, the word confess or confession appears many times in the Bible, but uh, other than that, when do you ever hear the word confess? Usually it's in a, it's in a movie or a TV show about crime the police or the, the prosecutor will, will talk to the suspect and try to get him to confess to the crime. And so it's, you know, great drama. When the guy finally breaks down and says, okay, okay, I confess, I did it. I killed him. Well, in the Bible, it's a little different from that. In the Bible, the word confess basically means to agree. And specifically, it means to agree with God. The Greek word for confess literally means to say the same thing as someone else. In this case, to say the same thing as God to agree with him. And confession doesn't always have to be about something bad, like committing a, a crime or you know some other sin. It can also mean confessing something good. Here are some examples. In Romans 10, it's confessing 
that Jesus is Lord. And in 2 Corinthians 9, it's the confession of the gospel. Good stuff. Confession means that we agree with God that Jesus is Lord, and we agree with him about the truth of the gospel. But most of the time, even in the Bible, it's people confessing sin. And that's what we have here in Psalm 32. Uh, verses, <clears throat> verses 3 through 5 describe what I guess you could call a process that went on in David's life. Because of some sin he, he had committed, he says, when I kept silent, in verse 3, that may have been a time when he really knew the truth, but, but didn't confess. Maybe for a time he refused to confess. And so it would seem that, that God was, you know, kind of working on him a little bit. And for David, it was a miserable time. He mentioned groaning here. He said that his, his vitality, his strength were gone. Well, that doesn't sound like much fun. If you have a relationship with God, refusing to acknowledge your sin will do that to you. And here's why. As a Christian, you now have God's standard of holiness. And if you're not living up to it, it shows, at least to God and, I suppose, to yourself. The closer you get to God, the more miserable your sin will make you. And that's actually good, because it helps you realize that you need to confess and to abandon your sin, the practice of sin. For David, the break came in verse 5, when he finally confessed. And that's when he found mercy and grace. I think God loves to hear his people confess to him, to agree with him about our sin and about the gospel. When we come around to his way of seeing things, that's when he can help us. But some people are stubborn. It just takes a long time to reach the point. And so they keep silent, like David. Or they'll say, I'm not such a bad guy after all. There's lots of people worse than I am. Not realizing that, goodness, even one sin should be enough to keep somebody out of heaven. But 1 John 1, 9 has that great promise. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive our sin. Now, God forgives us not so much because we confessed, but because of his mercy and because Jesus has paid the price that our sin deserves. That's the basis for being forgiven. But the way that it comes to us is through our confession and our faith in him, our agreement with God about who we are, what we've done, and what he did about it by grace through faith. But it's hard, isn't it? We usually try to hide our sins, certainly from other people, sometimes even from ourselves. If we're going to confess sin to God, well, then we'll have to face up to it ourselves. And that's hard, because it hurts to be honest about doing things that are wrong or failing to do things that we should. But that's part of the process getting through the hurt and knowing that God has forgiven us 
if we jump to the end of Psalm 32 for a minute, in verse 11, David was now rejoicing and singing, and it's all about you righteous, you upright in heart. These are people who know they're forgiven. What a difference between this and that miserable guy back in verses 3 and 4 who wouldn't confess his sin. The only answer God has provided is confession, our faith in him, and, of course, his forgiveness. Well, one more thing, repentance. <laughs> That's part of the gospel. This psalm doesn't mention repentance, but, of course, the New Testament emphasizes it over and over. I looked up the word repent and repentance. They appear eight times, at least in my version, they appear eight times in the Old Testament, 48 times in the New Testament. Psalm 32 covered confession and forgiveness. Can you see why we need the New Testament for the com complete picture? Confess, believe in Christ, repent, and be forgiven. That's the gospel we believe. And that's worth singing gospel songs about. My Muslim friend needs to know this. Everybody in the world who doesn't already know it needs to know this and believe it and commit to it. There's more in this 32nd Psalm, and maybe we'll get to that next time it's my turn. So, you other guys, stay away from Psalm 32. It's mine, all right? So, so to speak. <laughs> but first things first, if you've had trouble acknowledging your sin, and you probably have, don't be afraid to confess to God because of Jesus, he promises to forgive. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for such a great salvation. Thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness because of what Jesus did for us. As we receive what, what you have done for us, give us the desire and the power to do what you require, to believe, to confess, to, and to repent. By your grace, take us all the way through to the great day that's coming when Jesus returns to take us home. Amen.